So this is Pat Solver with the Doctor Ways In, and um, we have a really fun guest today. It's a return guest, Stefan Marsh, who's the founder and CEO of the micro CPAP device called Airing. And we had a chance to interview Stefan in September at the time that he was doing an Indiegogo um, campaign to raise money. I think he raised more than a million dollars, right, Stefan? Yes, it's about 1.2 now. $1.2 million on that. And we wrote an article and we posted our video interview on YouTube and we have gotten a ton of comments. And so I thought it would be really fun for us to get an update and have Stefan kind of respond to some of the comments that people have left on our site. So if you're ready to go, Stefan, the first question uh, obviously is everybody wants to know when is the product going to be on the market? Well, we have uh, been targeting 2017 from the beginning, and um, it's it's a pretty aggressive schedule. Um, I think that's still possible. Um, when you're doing product development, it's you you know you never really know uh, when you're developing something that is a breakthrough like this. But uh, we are. Uh, I think there's some things going on that we're, are really going to help uh, push us in that direction of, of of trying to still come in in 2017. Okay, well, that's uh, not too far away now. This year is going by remarkably fast. Um, and I understand what you're saying about uh, product development because I'm reading Elon Musk's book. And if you want to have the anxiety of somebody trying to develop a comp too complicated products, that's the, that's the book to read. Um, yeah. So, so Stefan, um, last time we talked, you didn't have a working prototype. Do you have a working prototype now? So as you would uh, think of a working prototype of the micro blowers, uh, per se, like a working prototype of that, the answer is no. Uh, the good news is uh, it's not a linear process. And so we have parts and pieces of it working, which are actually rapidly coming together now. So the, the quick answer is no, we're still working on the proof of concept prototype. Uh, but the uh, I guess the good part of that is uh, we're making very good prog progress and it's speeding up. So when we talked about the product coming to market in 2017, I meant actually being available to the public, but we know I'm assuming this device um, because it's for a uh, serious medical condition is going to have to have FDA approval. Um, and that means you have to have clinical trials. Can you describe the timeline for us a little bit from where you are now to almost getting your working prototype going to how you're going to get through the clinical trials and when you're going to approach the FDA and how that impacts when I can buy one of these things? Right. So I think most people would say that that process can be unpredictable uh, with, with the FDA and, and oftentimes people think it's a very long process. Uh, one of the things that we're uh, very hopeful of, and of course, we can't guarantee it, of course, but um, there is a, uh, a precedent. There's a, a process. It's called a fast track. It's a 510K program uh, where the FDA uh, looks for a predicate, something out there that they uh, have approved that's doing. So the thing that I point out to people is while this is a new device, it's really the sort of miniaturization of, of, of the bigger equipment, CPAP equipment that we're familiar with. So we haven't invented CPAP treatment. Um, so as long as if you think about it simply, in a simple way, if you think that we can put the same amount of air in you uh, from a little device under your nose as opposed to a mask and a hose, but the same flow at the same pressure, it should deliver the same treatment. And so we aren't inventing a treatment. We're not trying to approve, get approved the treatment. We're trying to get approved a miniaturization of an of a existing sort of system or device. Okay, so, so think, uh, I'm sorry. Awesome. That's a nice segue then into a comment that I heard, I read on Quora uh, from a respiratory therapist who said that, you know, this is nasal CPAP and it's going to increase the resistance when you're breathing and it's going to cause people to automatically open their mouth and start mouth breathing, which will sort of bypass your device that's going to hold open the airways. Um, and he was pretty adamant that he thought that meant that your approach wouldn't work. What do you have to say to that? Um, well, um, I don't, I don't know this gentleman or his background, but I can only uh, tell you what I've been told by the doctors on our advisory board. And 
many doctors I've spoken to, uh, including at the uh, National Institutes of Health. And um, if your nose is working right, this is with no CPAP, no treatment, anything. If your nose is working right, nature has a tendency to have you breathe through your nose and not out of your mouth. So if you put a device in your nose and if it is allowing you to, as you breathe in, to get all the air your body needs, and even if you build a slight more pressure, uh, because CPAP pressures measured in centimeters of water are really not lots of pressure pressure in terms of pounds per square inch that most of us think about. So if you are getting all the air that you want and uh, a little bit more for the to build a, a slight bit of pressure, it uh, is not likely to make you open your mouth because your nature would have you have your mouth closed. Okay. Well, you know, when I walk down the aisle on the airplane, all the people who are asleep <laughs> are like this <laughs> with their mouth open. So I, I hope you're right about that one because I really want this device to work. Um, yeah. So there was another comment that um, kind of was skeptical about whether your micro blowers were going to be able to generate enough pressure to hold open the airway structures that are um, getting in the way when you're trying to breathe with the uh, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. Well, um, it's hard for a lot of people to believe that something so small could, could first of all, create enough flow rate of air to actually satisfy your inhalation, uh, and then a little bit more to actually elevate the, the pressure slightly for your, for your treatment level. Um, and I understand that uh, it's difficult for people to to uh, to to uh, to see that, um, but I have to tell you that that's kind of what a breakthrough is. Um, the little microblowers in there are, are an invention, um, one that is we're patenting as we speak. Um, there are many many of them. One of the the things that's very unique about them is they're very small. Not only are they very small, but they can build, be built in a manufacturing paradigm, which makes them extremely low cost, which is why they can be a one-time use device. So if you have a little bit of air push by a unit, one, one blower, and you need a lot of air push, then you have to have many blowers. And then we also uh, have those little blowers running thousands of times each second. So they're, they're, you know, huffing and puffing, they're sucking the air in and blowing it out. So if you add all that up, um, the, the typical tidal uh, uh, volume of, a, of an adult is about a half a liter. The capacity of your lungs is bigger, but the amount of uh, air you actually breathe in and out in a, in, a, in a cycle of inhalation and exhalation is about a liter. That relates to about 333 milliliters per second. And... If you have enough little devices that are running fast enough, you can produce 333 milliliters per second or more. And so you're blowing, okay, I, that sounds good. Um, but you're blowing all of this air against the mucous membranes inside the nose. And I'm assuming some of it will get down to the back of the throat. Um, aren't I going to end up dry as a bone? Like, uh, what's this going to do to my mucous membranes? The CPAP machines all have a humidifier humidifier component as a part of, of, of their of, of the device. Right, right. So I guess my answer has been to that, which is again consulting the doctors that we we talked to. Um, I've been told that nature has done a very good job in designing the nose, and um, because of all of the mucous membrane, and because uh, you may not know this, but when you exhale, uh, the moisture in your breath. Is, is really high. And so you have, and that's based on the, you know, the water that's in your body, right? So, so you have a sort of a built-in humidification system. And so when things are right, forget about sleep apnea for the moment, uh, you should be able to breathe just fine and be humidified, and like uh, maybe just a normal person on a bed that wouldn't need a humidifier or anything. So what I think about what I believe is true, and I think it's from an engineering perspective, it's kind of obvious that when you blow uh, just a tremendous amount of air and you blow it at, uh, at your nose, let's say you're using nose pillows or something like that, uh, continuously, both in, as you inhale and both as you exhale, um, I can absolutely believe that you would dry yourself out. Absolutely. Um, but I think if you have a smart device 
that will uh, provide the air that you need when you inhale and not blow so hard um, when you exhale that you're not going to dry out as much. And so our design and our uh, expectation is that it will not require uh, humidification or a separate humidifier. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, these are all theoretical concerns, of course, and, of, and your device right now is theoretical, and That's we're it. really not going to know whether it works until you're finished with it. You put it on some people and you run some clinical trials. So we still have a ways to go here um, before we can all, um, you know, start saving our pennies to buy one of these things, which <laughs> leads me to the next question, um, sure. which is... Um, you talk about having this be a throwaway device that is going to be low cost, so about $3 per device. And by the way, I had uh, some comments on from people, environmental types, who said that made them a little uncomfortable that we were going to end up with a lot of micro CPAPs in the landfill. Uh, but my real question is uh, around the cost. I think you said the total cost per year, if you add up all these $3, is going to be about the price of a traditional CPAP. Um, is that still the case, or do you think now that you've put more work into it, it's going to be more or less? Uh, Three dollars is is my target for this uh, sale price to the to the end user. Um, and if you multiply that by three hundred sixty five, I think it's last time I did the math, something like a thousand ninety five something. Um, that's if you pay the the full price with no um, reimbursement from your insurance company. Um, but if you are reimbursed, and if you're reimbursed at a maybe a typical 80%, then you're talking about $65 or 65 cents, sorry, a night. Um, and that's more in the, I forget what it is, 248, or I, I could grab my calculator, but it's much, much less. Okay. And you probably haven't had any conversations yet with insurers around whether they would cover this. Usually they follow Medicare's lead, so you probably are going to have to get this approved by Medicare. Um, in yes. order to see the commercial insurers uh, follow along? Yes. Uh, it's too early for us. Well, maybe it's never too early. Uh, we, we, we have some unofficial conversations. But um, I think my the advice I'm getting is that insurance companies more and more these days, I, I think most people may know this, they're uh, uh, getting to be a, a lot more uh, results-oriented um, in terms of what they're, what they're willing to pay for. And um, I think the thing with uh, CPAP therapy, which is known to be effective in treating OSA, um, the real trick is getting somebody to use it. Um, and as you well know, and as my brother well knows, and uh, as I well know, that um, that's hard for some people to do, a lot of people to do. And so I think the insurance companies, uh, I think they, the reason that they would like to pay for an effective treatment is it's probably uh, actuarial. It's probably that long term. It's more cost effective for them to do that than to treat the, the consequences otherwise. Um, I think they're going to be probably very excited uh, about um, you know a device that could uh, stave off some you know some later problems uh, if you would use it now. There are devices, as we say, that are out there that people don't use. And so, if all of a sudden you prove that it's effective in treating uh, the condition. Uh, and people are more likely to use it, then I think that's kind of a winning combination, and we're, we won't be surprised that they will uh, be interested in supporting that. So um, there are some new devices coming out of Israel. I haven't actually seen it, but there's one called the Zippa snoring device that's getting some hype on the internet. And then there's another one that some people say is like yours, although it's missing some important components, and that's the Provent, a little device that fits just in the nose. It really looks even smaller than your device. Um, are you familiar with, with the Provent? I am. Uh, well, I, I, I have been. I, I don't know if they've announced anything, you know, like yesterday or, or, or last month or something. But the Provent um, system that I'm familiar with is really a very simple system that um, is basically adhesive-backed little, uh, uh, I guess you would call them uh, vents, that uh, sort of like let air breathe in easily, but sort of block it, add some resistance when you exhale. Uh, the thought being that I read a paper about what they thought that the actual uh, process was that, that, that uh, they thought that would be 
cause it to be effective. Uh, I think most doctors that I've spoken to think that it has a limited range of effectiveness for maybe very, very slight, slight uh, people with slight apnea, apnea. but the, the idea is it's the back pressure uh, that when you breathe out, you have this resistance, um, but really it's an adhesive thing that sticks on the bottom of your nose, you know, so it's really not like our device at all. Um, the the Zippa thing is um, really a, a, a a dental appliance, as far as I can tell, something you put in your mouth and you bite down, and it uh, has a, a member that pushes your tongue uh, to orient it in a particular way. And again, that's really not like what we're doing at all. Um, I, we, we get, as you can imagine, um, literally thousands, or actually hundreds of thousands, but uh, thousands of emails. Uh, and one of the uh, common uh, responses that we get from people who are praying that we get this done as quickly as possible um, is that they've tried both CPAP, uh, couldn't tolerate it, and they've tried uh, some of the dental appliances, uh, but it just makes their gums sore and, and, and they just, they, it just, it's hard for them. It's hard for them too. So I think uh, this is a good point for me, talk about a segue. Um, it's uh, important for me to say to you and to your listeners uh, and viewers that it's my position, Airing's position, that until we can get there with the Airing device, which we really do hope will be uh, a lot more easily tolerated and used by people, that if you think you have obstructive sleep apnea or a breathing disorder like that, please try to find something that you can use in the, in the meantime until I can get our product there because it's really important that you uh, not suffer from the long-term effects of, of oxygen deprivation. And when you hold your breath and your oxygen level goes down in your blood, it's really not a, it's a very bad thing. And so if you can tolerate, if you can use a ProVent or a Zippa or the, the, the standard equipment, uh, God bless you, please try. Well, thank you. Cause that's a, that is a really great statement uh, for all of our listeners. If you're using a CPAP now, keep using it until the air ring is out, hopefully next year. Um, don't quit using it and, and don't delay starting until, um, and until there's something that's more effective. So lots and lots of people, you get a lot of emails. We get a ton of comments on this article that we wrote in September and also a lot of views on the video interview that we did with you um, uh, last September. So people really, and all of them are saying, I'll sign up, you need somebody for a clinical tester, I, I, I wanna do it. So a lot of enthusiasm about the idea. So an important point is, um, how are you doing with fundings? You raised $1.2 million with Indiegogo. Is that going to be enough to get your product to market? Um, mm -hmm. Or are you going to need, or do you have other outside investors, or are you going to have to raise another round? Where are you at? We, because we know no matter how much you want to get this done, if you don't have the money to do it, it isn't going to happen. Right, right. So, um you know, we've been developing this uh, since even before the Indiegogo uh, campaign. And so our, our position there, uh, as we try to, you know, people for their interest and their support is it's about accelerating the process because product development is oftentimes difficult, not easy, uh, a little unpredictable. Um, and you're right, any company, any, any task, any effort needs to have the capital resources to be able to, to push it through. And so will the $1.2 million get us across the finish line with a real product in the hands of people? Absolutely no. Um, we are, uh, are in, in our strategy and uh, our plans involve uh, strategic partners uh, that have the wherewithal and the interest and of course the economic incentive of, 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 of uh, manufacturing and distributing a, a real product, the air ring device. So my job right now, and my focus has to be on making it work, doing the proof of concept prototype, putting it in noses, validating its, its effectiveness, getting it approved by the FDA, and getting it manufactured. But I can't do that serially. I have to be working in, on all of that in parallel. I can't quite do the FDA right now, but I can be building the relationships for people who can turn microblowers into components then those components can be integrated into products, the air ring device. And so I'm working very hard uh, on building those relationships right now. It gives us the, of moving this, as I said, it's not linear, it starts out slow, but then it can move very quickly. 
Well, thank you, Stefan. It sounds like you're making lots of pro pro progress here. And the other thing, um, in addition to sharing these updates, I think you've given our, our viewers and listeners some insight into the life of a, of a product development entrepreneur. It's not easy. <laughs> thank you very much. And we look forward to checking in again with you sometime towards the end of the year, the beginning of next year. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.